definitely, you know, in, in farming, it's a high risk business. So, you know, definitely being able to try before you buy is, uh, is a good idea. It's like, uh, it's like before you buy a car, you test drive it, you know, before you marry someone you date. <laughs> well, before you buy a farm, you want to, might want to try farming first. And so I think that's something that the incubator allows people to do is that if you're not 100% sure you want to make all those investments and, you know, normal, normal cost of a farm is, you know, four or $500,000. If you go really on the cheap on everything, you know, if you look at land, building all the infrastructure and everything, uh, unless it was in production of vegetables before, but if it wasn't with the land and everything together, you're looking at like $400,000 of debt. This is the Ruminant Podcast. I'm Jordan Marr. The Ruminant is a website and podcast that explores what good farming looks like. At theruminant.ca, you'll find photo-based blog posts, essays, gear and book reviews, as well as show notes for each episode of the podcast. I tweet at Ruminant blog, and you can email me day or night at editor at theruminant.ca. Okay, on with the show. All right, so today's episode is all about incubator farms. So what's an incubator farm? Incubator farms uh, are land-based farmer training programs. They, they give new farmers the opportunity to test and to hone their skills before they enter out into the wider world of business. So it gives them an opportunity uh, with access to land and equipment to give farming a go before they then fully launch the business. That's Aaron Newton. Aaron is the coordinator of the Alma C. Lomax Incubator Farm in Concord, North Carolina. He's one of the voices you'll be hearing in this episode. Another voice is owned by Jim Thompson, a recent alumnus of an incubator farm in Quebec called La Plateforme Agricole de Lange Gardien. Jim and his partner recently purchased some farmland after spending a few years at the incubator farm establishing their business. The other voice you'll hear in this episode is David Mazur Goulet. David spent two seasons at the same incubator farm as Jim, but left the program for reasons you'll hear about. I want to make it clear at the outset that I specifically sought out David in order to gain the perspective of someone for whom the incubator concept didn't work very well. So if most of what you hear from David is critical, it's because I asked him to focus on the stuff that made his experience challenging. Okay, so let's spend a few minutes with Aaron Newton. Aaron's going to describe how his incubator runs. Now, of course, there are many incubators and more springing up all the time around North America, but the way this one runs sounds fairly similar to the way that the one at Lange Gardien runs, and I, I think it's safe to assume that, that many incubators run in a way that's similar to, to how Aaron describes it. So we're going we're gonna to use Aaron's description as a bit of a stand-in with the understanding that not every incubator runs the same way. I started out by asking Aaron to describe the Elma C. Lomax Incubator Farm. The Elma C. Lomax Incubator Farm was founded in 2009. We're located here in North Carolina, about 22 miles northeast of Charlotte. Charlotte's a million-plus metropolitan area, so we're on that outer edge where we move from urban into rural environment. The the farm itself is 30.6 acres. About nine of that is in production, vegetable production. Then we have some um, facilities that are included on the property, greenhouse, a high tunnel, Uh, post-harvest handling, wash and pack shed, and some other logistical space. And then we have some area in floodplain um, and some mixed hardwood, pine, um, wooded area as well. Next, I asked Aaron how much land an incubator participant can get once they're accepted into the program. What we've found is that we need to match the amount of land we make available to the skill sets of a farmer in training. We we call them FITs, farmers in training. Usually that means starting small. For a particular, you know, we have a a strong eight-month growing season. You could argue that we have a 12-month growing season. Um, So so for part of that year, for about a six-month period, they may only get 500 or 1,000 row feet to work with. And then as they prove they can keep it weeded, watered, harvest, and begin to take that food to market, will quickly expand the amount of acreage uh, to which they have access. Um, Usually that's not going to be any more than about an acre of land. And then after several years, we begin to scale back the amount of land they have here as we help them transition 
out of the incubator farm and onto their own land base. I see. And I was going to ask you about how long the term is. So is it is there a set maximum term length that, that I would be allowed to be at the incubator farm? Or is it, as you say, more of a transition-based approach where we slowly phase out the amount of land that I'm given? It is a transition-based approach We um, with a target. So our target is three years, but, but that um, there is never a date after which you are no longer ever allowed on the property. And in fact, the relationships continue with our graduates in some form or fashion, whether that is coming back just to take advantage of educational opportunities or coming back to, to, to take advantage of some physical resources, space in the greenhouse or, or temporarily some space in our walk-in cooler. The relationships almost always continue to a certain extent after that three-year period. How many farmers does the Lomax handle at any given time? Sure. So I like to make the distinction between our official farmers in training. These are people with whom we have a, a signed lease agreement. They have legal access to particular plots of land here at the incubator farm. Uh, those are our formal farmers in training, and, and we have seven of them. And depending on their needs and the type of product they're looking to grow, we have room for probably about 10 before we begin to get cramped. What about facilities? Let's let's talk about your farmers in training. They have access to a, a number of facilities on the farm, and I'm wondering if you can summarize those and maybe talk. we'll talk a bit about how they share them. Sure. So we have a 95 by 33 foot heated greenhouse. We have a 105 by 34 foot unheated high tunnel. Uh, those are both facilities that they share. Uh, the high tunnel is managed um, by our organic research coordinator. So she does work, uh, Gina, Tom, uh, Gina Moore does work in the high tunnel and invites the farmers in training to be a part of that so that they can learn. The greenhouse is different. We divvy it up um, by the pallet, actually. We use pallets as tables, pallets on cinder blocks. And so the farmers in training and other participants can all rent space in the greenhouse by the pallet. And this is primarily for transplant production, um, but really for any use, for any growing use that they have. We have a, um, a wash and pack shed where we have post harvest handling, three triple bay wash sinks, five stainless steel packing tables, uh, an ice machine, a 10 by 20 foot walk-in cooler where they can rent shelf space. And then we have um, various equipment owned by the program, a Kubota tractor, and then we have quite a few other smaller pieces of equipment that are owned by participants, or in some cases past participants, um, which are shared. Typically, there's a lot of sharing going on here. What I've found is that with all things Incubator Farm, which is very, which is about this shared space concept, it's very important to keep the expectations clear so and then after that there's a lot there is a lot of compromise that that happens and so if we get into a situation where using the greenhouse i'll use the greenhouse as an example um, i make it very clear who is going to be where in the greenhouse um, and then if we need to do some swapping or moving around um, you know we do it but at the end of the day Part of my management of the farm includes making sure that everyone knows uh, what's in bounds and what's out of bounds. All right. So at this point, I'm going to bring in Jim Thompson so that you can start to get the perspective of an incubator participant. And one of the first questions I asked Jim was how he came to be involved with the incubator at Lounge Guardian in the first place. Okay. So we became involved in the incubator, which is um, in uh, Lounge Guardian. Um, in 2011 because we had been looking for, I'd worked on other farms for um, two other farms for a total of six years and we'd been looking around for land around Montreal and the prices were so tremendously expensive that it was totally ridiculous that we'd ever be able to afford it and so we moved to um, Gatineau and um, we already knew about this project so before we we made the move we we contacted the uh, um, the incubator in Los Gardien and uh, put in an application, we were accepted. And so we started our business in 2011. 
And so um, the maximum time we can stay at the incubator was five years. And so we've just come up to the point now where um, we've had to move and we're starting our new project on a, on, on a new piece of land. So what does it cost to be part of an incubator farm? Well, that's definitely one variable that does differ across different farms. It totally depends on on how the incubator farm is set up in the first place and what level of funding it has from other sources. So I'm going to let both Jim and Aaron talk about the costs associated with their respective incubator farms. Here's Jim. Yeah, it was, it was depending on the year, it was somewhere between two to $3,000 um, in terms of the costs that were that, that were incurred there. And you pay a membership fee, which is... Um, Four to six hundred dollars, depending on how many years you've, you've been at the platform, uh, and then there's also um, a price per acre. Um, there's a rental cost per hour for machinery, and then we share the certification costs, the electricity costs, and the greenhouse costs among all the users. And there's also a per square foot fee for the greenhouse. Um, and so that's kind of how it works in terms of, of, of uh, financially how, how it functions. Right. And when they sign the lease, it's a five-year lease. So it guarantees you the right for five years, um, which is important because it makes sure that uh, some of the investments that you make into your land, like liming or, or adding extra fertility or, or manure, um, kind of don't get wasted or they don't scoop the land out from under you or, or that sort of thing. So. Um, it is important that we have that five-year period to to really develop our business. So, just so listeners understand, um, that's two to three thousand dollars a year you were spending on, but, but that includes, I mean, your utilities, your tractor costs, the, a, a heated greenhouse, the land, mm-hmm. the land rental, the certificate, the organic certification costs. I mean, that overall seems quite reasonable for a new farmer instead of having to perhaps like buy a new greenhouse for you know, 10 to, 10 to $30,000 or something alone uh, or a new oh, tractor exactly. for, or a used tractor even for 5,000 and, and, and much higher. So that, it, I mean, overall, yeah. am I right? It seems pretty reasonable. No, no, no. It's very reasonable. I mean, uh, you know, we didn't have to, for the first five years of our business, um, we didn't have to borrow any money at all. Uh, to set up at this new farm, we're looking at a project cost of $100,000. That's just to get set up. So if you can, you know, you look at what is, you know, just interest on a hundred thousand dollars is three thousand a year. When I ask Aaron about the costs associated with participating in the Lomax incubator, he starts off by pointing out that he believes that the Lomax has one of the lowest per year costs for participants of of any incubator, and that's owing to some good stable funding they have from other sources and their belief that uh, they want to make it as affordable as possible for for farmers to participate. We charge our um, farmers in training, $240 per year for access to the program. And then we have an a la carte menu of um, options, access to the greenhouse, to our germination chamber, post-harvest handling, the ice machine, and our walk-in cooler are all additional fees. And then tractor work is um, paid for by the hour. So for a first uh, first-year farmer, in training, they're going to spend somewhere between four and five hundred dollars for access to the program. All right, so five hundred dollars per year to participate at Lomax versus two to three thousand by Jim's estimate up at Lange Gardien. Now, in my opinion, five hundred dollars a year or even five thousand dollars a year, which is what Aaron tells me is about the upper upper range that people can expect to pay at an incubator farm, it's still a good deal at five thousand a year. And and I think that's the point. The whole idea with an incubator is to lower the risk for new farmers, to allow them to try try it out and get their feet wet before they have to incur a whole bunch of really serious costs in setting up their business. Here's Jim Thompson. Oh, of course, yeah, because if, if people are paying real costs, um, you know, they get to the end of the year, they wouldn't have anything left. Because you're looking at, you know, somebody who's starting off their first year might have gross sales of fifteen to $25,000, which... You know, it's really not, a, you know, it's barely enough. It's not even enough to live on. So maybe they got a few grants, maybe they got a, uh, uh, or something like that that helps get them by, or they got a no interest loan or something like that that, that they can access. But definitely, um, definitely uh, keeping those costs down, I think, for the first few years for farmers is, 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 is 
hugely important. Aaron Newton. A lot of it, a lot of it is about the incubator farm lowering the level of risk. And so if you did, if you decided that farming was for you and you went and you purchased 10 acres and a tractor and you, you move, you and your wife moved to the country and you began to grow vegetables and then you realized that you didn't like it or it wasn't any good, um, you could avoid, um, losing, you know, going bankrupt or getting a divorce or all of the terrible outcomes that could, that could happen if you jumped in. Uh, with both feet because of the, the, and a lot of that's because of the high capital um, costs of getting a farm up and going. Another potential strength of an incubator farm are the educational opportunities that an incubator can offer in various forms. I asked Aaron about this, and he, he talked about some of the formal educational opportunities they offer in terms of workshops offered by uh, Carolina Extension Services, uh, getting farmers out into the community onto other farms to see what they're doing. And he also talked about the direct assistance that he can provide when farmers in his incubator farm encounter certain problems, as well as the mentorship that the farmers in the program can offer each other. Oh, absolutely. And, and so much of that happens. It is as simple as someone putting up some sort of fence extender um, and then everyone just sees it and, and gets the concept immediately and then it spreads like wildfire and everyone thinks, oh, I can, you know, I can make my fence taller if I, if I do this simple thing I saw Eric doing. But then also they'll, they'll seek each other out. If it's not something, it's something that's not quite so simple and they'll say, hey, I saw you were really killing it with the kale. I mean, you just, it, they, they look beautiful. They're they look so much better than mine. What are you doing? And the person will reciprocate and say, you know, I'm doing this. And hey, by the way, I saw your carrots are doing really nicely. And I've always had struggled with carrots. What are you doing? A lot of that's happening here. In fact, I'd argue that um, outside of the, the classes, there's they're probably learning more from each other than they are from staff here at the incubator, or at least as much. On top of that, then we have the one on one, which happens all the time. Someone will come into my office or, or, or one of my, or one of the other staff members offices and say, Hey, I just cannot remember how to build this header pipe out and I need to irrigate my field. Will you come spend half an hour with me? So some of that happens as well. Now at the top of the episode, I mentioned that I invited my third guest, David mazur onto the show to talk mostly about what went wrong with his incubator experience. But that doesn't mean he didn't have plenty of good things to say about incubators. And and one thing that he definitely agrees with Aaron about is the value of the mentorship that takes place while you're at the incubator. One of the the great aspects of an incubator farm is the fact that you're working with other farmers. And if you're really new, then most of them will have more experience and you get to really learn tons from them and share. And it's um, it's really invaluable because let's say you're a new farmer, they can tell you if there's a which, which, which pests are problems at that farm or diseases are problems, and you can kind of prepare and mitigate for those before they happen. So clearly the incubator model has a lot going for it, but, uh, well, I figured it can't all be rosy. And one of the things I was really curious to ask my guests about was how common it is for problems to arise around the shared use of all the equipment that the incubator farmers are sharing while at the incubator farm. Both Aaron and Jim acknowledge that it can be challenging at times. You know, what you save, you, you save a lot off the infrastructure, um, but you also pay, in a, in a way, a little bit with your time to, you know, negotiating and talking to people and, and coming up with solutions to problems when you run out of space in the greenhouse. And Okay, well, you can move your onions, you know, to the unheated greenhouse. We have to set up tables there, and then we have to do it all as a group. And you end up doing a lot of stuff like that, which does kind of take up time. Whereas if it's your own space, you, you can organize it much more in advance and you don't have to deal as much with those communication issues. You're just dealing with your staff who essentially kind of does what you say. So it's, it's, it's a little bit less negotiation on that, that level. So there is that level of incubators where there's, you know, there's always that level of negotiating with other producers because they, they want to make their farm business run. You want to make your farm business run. And you don't want to be in a situation where you have, you know, uh, a conflict happening. So you always need to be like looking ahead at how your business is affecting these other businesses. And so that's something that I've, you know, that 
at the new farm, I just, I won't have to deal with as much. I deal with my neighbors occasionally, but I won't have to deal with having literally somebody else kind of within, within that space of the production environment uh, every day. Right. Big limiting factor on the farm was water. So we had about 30 gallons per minute that we could share, Mm -hmm. which was sufficient um, most of the time. But it meant that we had to do certain things like I got to the point where what I would do is I would set up all my irrigation, I would test it, and then I would wake up at 3 a.m., go turn on the irrigation, and then when my me or my farm manager arrived at 7 in the morning, then we would turn it off. And that was a way that we dealt with that issue. So, so definitely at the new farm, we want to kind of be able to, you know, water during a regular time yeah <laughs> less day. less less ungodly hours yeah i get it <laughs> it is a challenge and so you hit on it a lot of it is about prevention and so um i try and do that in in several ways one we i've, I've worked and others have worked really hard on creating a community so there is a sense in here that everyone is in it together and as, as i'm talking to people about their desire to be a participant out here, potentially a farmer in training, I let them know that this is this is about sharing and cooperating and that if you don't work well in that environment, this isn't going to work for you. The farmers in training are required to meet monthly and half of that meeting is about education, but half of it is set aside to air all of those sorts of issues and develop cooperatively develop situations or, or you know ways to address but those th- things that do come up. And so there, not only are we bringing it up and we're doing it in person, but we're, we're collectively trying to address the situation in a way that, that is, is at least palatable to everyone. Um, so, and, and then also, um, sometimes it is about just putting in place the right protocol for sharing. And Aaron, as you were, as you were describing that to me, I, I, I was just thinking, I suppose a silver lining to the reality that there's going to be a little bit of conflict anyway over over just sharing resources is that the whole point of the incubator is to incubate is for the farmers to move on to their own situation so i mean i I guess it'd be analogous to to the 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 point in many of our lives when we're we have housemates when that suddenly gets old and it's your 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 really messy housemate can be what spurs you to finally get your own place you, yeah, you've moved to the head of the class, man. This is this is absolutely. <laughs> so I'll give you an example. We have a salad spinner. We have one five-gallon salad spinner, and it belongs to the program. But ultimately, people will get frustrated because on Fridays, as everyone gets ready for Saturday market, the post-harvest handling uh, area is hopping. And, you know, the first few times that you, you need to use that spinner and you can't get to it because other people are already are, are using it, you're thinking to yourself, I need to get myself my own salad spinner. Um, so, yeah, so that's part of that's part of the – that's sort of the, one of the built-in ways to get them to, to move on. So so you your job is to manage conflict but not manage it so well that they never want to leave. <laughs> <laughs> I like that. Yes, that, yes that's uh. true. So the thing is, is they provide a minimum infrastructure. And I actually think that's an important element is that they provide a minimum infrastructure because the thing is, is, you know, when you jump from that farm to a new farm, um, you're going to be dealing with, you know, it's, it's, it's in a way a step back. And if the step is too far back, then I think it could be a real shock. Ah, so, right. right. So, you know, you want it to be good enough that people are able to make money and to have what is necessary that they can they can develop their farm business but at the same time i think it also needs to be basic enough that people kind of want to move on another potential limitation of incubators or at least a limitation that i assumed was a problem before i headed into these interviews is the limited types of agriculture they seem to be really good at encouraging or incubating from my own limited experience i had noticed that a lot of incubator farmers tend to be focusing on small-scale vegetables and you know, that would make some sense. Vegetables are a little bit less capital intensive to get into, and you can make a half decent income on a small amount of space if you're growing intensive market vegetables. Still, I wanted to talk to these folks about whether it is true that there's a big focus on vegetables, and, and if so, if that's a problem, and, and what can be done about it. Aaron, is there, I mean, I get the sense that, that your incubator and probably most incubators are 
are focused on veggie production and farmers who want to do veggie production. And I'm wondering a, if that's true and B, if you could speculate as to why incubators tend to be oriented towards veggie production. So if I'm thinking specifically about why veggie production and, and not protein production, I think that vegetable production is, I'm not going to say it's easier, but it has less moving parts. Um, for us, it's a very, there's a very specific reason, which is that no one lives at the incubator farm, and it's very difficult to manage animals if you don't have someone on site 24 hours a day. Um, it's very uh, inconvenient to come back to work at 9.30 at night in June because that's about as early as the chickens, as, as you can get them to roost in my part of the world. Um, it's just not dark yet. So for that and for predator reasons and for other reasons, it's, it's just difficult to manage animals for a distant, from a distance. Um, so I think veggies has a fewer um, moving parts to it, and so it's easier. And it also requires less land. I mean, you can, as I mentioned, none of our participants have access to more than an acre, which would allow an incubator farm to set up with, with much smaller space and needed infrastructure. If you're suddenly talking about trying to teach someone, um, you know, how pastured, pastured beef or something. <laughs> exactly. And I know a few of those programs exist, but now you need huge acreage, which is a big management issue. And you need, you know, you need trailers and you need all, I, I don't do beef, so cattle, so I don't know, but there's a lot more stuff that you do need um, that we don't need to do vegetable production. In addition to the challenges that, that Aaron just talked about, Jim also mentions just the reality of the amount of land that many incubators have to, to, to give out and how the overall amount of land and the individual parcels that are given out to incubator farmers affects the type of production that they do. Really, you know, I think that it's important with an incubator to not limit people by saying you only get a certain amount of space because different crops have a different value per acre. And so if you want it to be a profitable business, it needs to make sure that, you know, that it's flexible. Otherwise you only get, if you limit it too much, you're only going to get one type of producer, which is super high value crops like vegetables or flowers or herbs or things like that. You're not going to get other, other crops that are maybe a little less valuable per acre. A related question I had for Aaron was the potential for an incubator farm with the best of intentions to start pumping out too many veggie growers in an area that might already be saturated with vegetables. I'm just wondering if that can create a problem in some communities because even though you and I, I suspect, would both agree that over the long term, there's a lot more market share to, to, to create in terms of all the people that aren't currently supporting small-scale veggie production uh, with their purchasing dollars. But in any given year or few years, a community might be saturated with veggie producers. Um, and so I'm not asking you to talk necessarily about Lomax and about your region, but just in general, like, does that, is there anything to what I've just said? And does it suggest that you wouldn't just want to plunk an incubator down in, in, in any community? Do you have to think about the supply of vegetables and, or do you, do you, have, do, you ever, do you see any examples of incubators where, there's not, where they create tension in the community with other f commercial farmers? Yeah, that's, there's a lot in there's a lot in that in that question. Um, so I can I can say specifically that we knew that in all of Cabarrus County we had 13 acres in vegetable production, and that there was an enormous demand for locally grown vegetables. So we knew we weren't going to bump up against that, at least anytime soon. We knew from a regional study that there's actually a $662 million spending gap between what we can grow here uh, and, what, and, the, and the demand. So there's an enormous demand with our million plus Charlotte metro region right next door. So we did think through those things. I can imagine that there are areas where you wouldn't want to perhaps plunk down an incubator and generate more veggie growers because uh, of saturation or near saturation. I think that the, the vegetable growers that learn to differentiate themselves within the market are going to be more successful. And that can come from growing something 
very specific that no one is growing um, here. I think for us that's going to be um, vegetables marketed towards the Asian and Hispanic communities that are a, a part of our community. I don't see that need being met. That's just an example. But they're doing it in other ways, um, mushroom production, uh, honey, sorghum syrup, if you can imagine. This is something that um, no one has done in our region for a long, long time, but looks like there is a demand and a way to differentiate themselves and then also sell all of the other more traditional vegetables that are grown and, and eaten here. Personally, I think that protein production is a really reasonable, legitimate small farm mix um, in, in terms of production. I think that those men and women who go into vegetable production and then also have laying hands and meat birds and, you know, potentially sheep and goat and, um, and, and even beef cattle production, I think they're likely to be more successful. Um, yeah, and then to further differentiate themselves with flour or fiber, um, these, these are all valid ways to go about differentiating yourself. At the same time, th there's, a, there's a conversation in the incubator farm community right now about what role we play in helping food system development. And, and this comes in part from the need many of us feel to be out in front helping to create the markets that will demand the products that our new veggie growers are producing. And so in some cases, and, and Lomax is, is, is a good example, we become the hubs for the community's conversation about food system development more broadly. And some of that is aimed at making sure that the veg, that, that people understand that this is happening in their community and the conversations around access and availability to good quality, great tasting, vegetables that are going to make people f look and feel better that that's here that's a part of your community and how to take advantage of it and how to cook and how to can and and then processing and, and what we can do with vegetables to make them available in other forms all those sorts of conversations need to happen in the community it's not necessarily the responsibility of the incubator farm to go out and make those conversations happen but by default we end up being the the sort of the place where those conversations start and, and potentially the places where those conversations continue as some of those types of projects develop a local food system. Are you aware of any instances where an incubator was like more like unwelcomed in a community? And I'm thinking, I, I mean, I'm thinking about other farmers and whether they see it as a threat. Have you ever talked to other coordinators who face that or, or, or are they generally just um, well received? I can tell you that here in our community, we have had um, mostly really positive response by the agricultural community. I've gotten the occasional comment from established vegetable growers saying, well, you know, I didn't have an incubator farm to get me started. Um, but typically, they understand that <laughs> the average age of a farmer, and in many cases, the person I'm talking to is at that age or older. Uh, 59 years old, they're going to retire, and they, at the end of the day, they want to see the land worked and taken care of, and they want, they um, they have a deep sense of pride in their work as farmers, and they want, uh, so they, they understand when other people want to do this really important work of feeding people. We, uh, we experienced a little bit of um, friction with the conventional agricultural community when we were getting established, because I think... Um, there was a perception that um, it was in that there may be an us against them sort of mentality between your more conventional commodity crop growers, people who um, make a living growing corn and soy and, and other commodity crops, and those people who are growing vegetables. And I've just tried to spend a lot of time helping everyone to understand that that's a that's a false um, choice that that it's not. It's not a, you know, eat corn and, and soy products or eat vegetables, that, that a healthy diet is very diverse and that there's plenty of room. And that in, in almost all cases, we're not really talking about going head-to-head -head in the market. Um, 
So that's, that's something else that we've had. To, and, and you know what? We didn't do a good enough job as a program early on about inviting the conversations with the conventional agriculture community to help them understand what we were doing. If we had done that, if we had already had our Farm and Food Council up and running and we had used that maybe as, as a way to draw them into the conversation, then maybe the perception would have been different. Um, but nonetheless, now we've come to a situation where um, the established agricultural community understands that we're at the end of the day, we're really about putting more farmers out on the land, and they think that's a good idea. So far in this conversation about incubator farms, we haven't heard we haven't heard a lot from my third guest, David Mazurgoulet. David spent two years at the incubator firm at Lange Gordien before deciding to, to pull out of the arrangement. His reasons for doing so were actually pretty straightforward. David has lots of great things to say about incubator farms, but there was one way in which his incubator farm experience didn't deliver, and it was pretty crucial. Here's David explaining why he pulled out of the program. So it wasn't an easy decision. Um, I've been running the first year, well, actually both years at the incubator. I essentially ran, I, I was renting land that was not, suitable for vegetable production and those uh, the first year was um, I had no way of knowing what kind of land I was going to get because I got accepted in the middle of winter so the ground was frozen and there was snow on the ground and uh, after that year I took on during that year 2014 that season I took on a lease of another parcel which at the time seemed really good and I had some vegetables growing in it and I had some good results however the following spring, it became really apparent with some heavy rains and a bit of digging around and learning more about soil in general that um, the, that field had a lot of problems which uh, effectively didn't make it a good, uh, good soil for growing vegetables. David went on to explain to me that the, the problem with, with the, that the soil fertility problem that he encountered was owing to a couple different factors. One, the incubator farm has been operating for some years now, and he figures there's just been too much production uh, on the land without without sufficient thought given to to fertility and to making sure that that uh, the soil isn't just being mined. I asked David if the farm requires regular soil testing from its participants. Yeah, they they pretty much don't require anything. Definitely in 2014, my first year, there was no penalties if some uh, if your fields were weedy. Um, or they didn't really, they didn't, uh, they didn't know, care if you put compost or if you didn't put compost, or how it was managed. In uh, 2015, there was some talk about taking, not reimbursing your security deposit if you didn't manage your fields properly. But really, that was only a couple hundred dollars. So for them, it would just be money in their pocket. In the end, but at the same time. At the end of the season, those those uh, fields would just be have a lot more seed, uh, wheat seeds in them, but they would have a couple hundred dollars in their pockets. So it doesn't really help them to have a couple hundred dollars if the the fields aren't being managed properly. After hearing his story, I mentioned to David that it seems like maintenance of soil fertility over the long term is is crucial for an incubator farm that's going to be welcoming wave after wave of farmer to come on the land and and learn the trade. Definitely, and um, the way I look at it now is that it's, it's um, I'm I was I'm definitely a greenhorn. I'm like new to farming, and I learned some hard lessons in the the last couple of years. Uh, at the same time, the incubator as well. They they definitely could have considering the I, the um, the principle of what an incubator is to help new farmers that don't have land to succeed in farming. I felt that there was definitely some. Some the, they were lacking in that department in terms of knowing what kind of soil they had, what it was suitable for, to ensure the best, the most success for new farmers. So I guess I guess if someone were considering considering an incubator, I guess a it's worth asking, um, finding references, in other words, past participants in the incubator, um, but also just finding out what kind of management is involved. Because I could totally I know that a lot of incubator projects end up being funded by levels of government or nonprofit organizations where they may not necessarily have experts at farming doing the primary oversight and management. And I could see that leading to trouble like you experienced. Yeah, no, definitely checking for references and doing your homework. And I think the most basic thing now that I've learned is 
go there with a shovel, and dig some holes. So clearly, joining an incubator farm isn't an absolutely fail-safe way to start your farming career. But it's a model that has worked for many people, including Jim Thompson, who was at the very same incubator farm as David. After five years at that incubator, Jim and his partner have purchased property in the area, and they're optimistic about their future in farming. And they didn't just derive benefits from their incubator while they were on site. Jim told me a couple of ways that his incubator experience was really helpful once he and his partner were ready to move on and buy their own land. It, yeah, it, it lends a lot of credibility. Yeah. And when you take over property in a new community, you know, credibility means a lot. You know, my neighbors come over and, and I, I get talking to them and whatever, and they're like, oh, so you're just starting up? I'm like, no, no, we've been producing for five years. They're like, oh, suddenly there's this whole other level of understanding, mutual respect, and that relationship of forming neighbors is extremely quick in those mm-hmm. circumstances because they kind of realize that like you're actually going to be like one of these people that's going to come and like help save farming in this na- in this community. And the other thing that this did was starting my own farm business gave me a farm revenue. So now when I actually go to the bank, they count my farm revenue as revenue. Whereas before what they, what they expected was that basically my wife's job would bankroll mm-hmm. the farm. Mm-hmm. And that's the reality for the majority of startup farms is that farm revenue bankroll farm for five to 10 years. And so bankers are actually being very smart in saying, well, we're not going to, you know, yes on your projection is you can make 20 grand. I don't believe you <laughs> because history has shown that the majority of you farmers who show up, uh, you know, after the first year, they're not making any money. So yeah. We need to make sure that you can make your payment so we don't have to foreclose on your farm. So we're mm-hmm. only going to use your partner's salary or your off-farm job or, or whatever. And so that's something that after five years, you know, if I look at when I first walked into um, the uh, – um, uh, it's called the Quebec, so it's like the uh, uh, Farm Credit Quebec. Um, when I first walked in there, of course, uh, you sit down with someone and, and, and you talk to them, and they're a bit skeptical about the business. But after five years, when I walked in, said I found a farm, they're like, "Great, come on in!" And then you sit down and you 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 know you you bring them your your new updated business plan, and they look at your numbers and they're like excited about it and and that sort of thing. The last thing I asked Jim is to what extent he would endorse incubators as a concept. Looking back, what does he think about the whole idea? I, I think I have to put it this way. I think almost all farmers go through a period of incubation. It can be either they go through an incubator, like I did. It can be that their parents were farmers, and their parents are either transitioning the farm to them or renting them land or lending them equipment or tractors to start their own, their own thing. Um, it can be that people move into a community and the neighbors are just really welcoming and supportive. It can be, um, I have some friends who, um, there's organic grain farmers and they've rented them land over the years and, you know, they're probably eventually going to purchase the land from them. So I think there's a lot of ways in which you can see incubation. I think the type of incubation that we went through is, is probably ideally suited for people that are not necessarily from a farming community to begin with. So especially people that are, you know, more urban, um, it's a good way to find out if you like living in the country. <laughs> yeah, right. If you, really, if you really like farming, if you really like, you know, doing it every day um, without having to invest the money into it. So I think for, I think it's not the only solution. I don't think that... Every farmer needs to go through an incubator, but I do think that for certain people, an incubator is something that is extremely invaluable and that it does create more farmers um, because of it. (laughs) And that seems like a really great place to leave off. So that's what I'm going to do. I hope you enjoyed that, folks. You know what? I want to you know, do a spiel now about how you can help promote the podcast or do other nice things for the podcast, but I, uh, I'm exhausted. Editing an episode like that takes a long time. So you don't have to listen to me anymore. You can listen to Vanessa instead, and I will talk to you next week. Wear no clothes so we never have laundry We'll owe nothing to this world of thieves Live life like it was meant to be our don't Red hot.
honey, I've got a plan to make our final escape. All we'll need is each other, a hundred dollars, and maybe a roll of duct tape. And we'll run right outside of the city's reaches We'll live off chestnut spring water and peaches We'll owe nothing to this world of thieves And live life like it was meant to be Because why would we live in a place that don't want us? A place that is trying to bleed us dry. We could be happy with life in the country. With salt on our skin and the dirt on our hands. I've been doing a lot of thinking. Some real soul searching And here's my final resolve I don't need a big old house Or some fancy car To keep my love going strong So we'll run right out into the wilds and graces We'll keep close quarters with gentle faces And live next door to the birds and the bees And live life like it was meant to be